Hey, friends and fam, it's John, and it's time for the J-Mark Cast for Monday, February 13th. What's going on? How are you? Thank you for listening in for another week of the J-Mark Cast. It's been a while since I've done an episode like this because there was one episode where it was an interview, and then there was another one where it was just me reading out loud my uh, Substack um, writing piece, which if you haven't subscribed to my Substack yet, please do so. Go to uh, jmartfit.substack.com and you can read or listen to, I guess, to my autobiography. I've written three parts so far. They're pretty short. They're fairly readable. But I also get these uh, episodes, the Jmart cast episodes posted on there as well. And then I upgraded my State of Health podcasts in there as well. It's one of the tabs of State of Health. Anyway, check it out. That's kind of like the hub for finding Jmart right now. And then through there, you can get to my socials as well. Instagram and Twitter are the main ones I use right now at jmartfit for both of them. And so, yeah, last week's episode of the Jmart cast seemed to do pretty well. Really appreciate the support. I got a bunch of podcast downloads that my, you know, uh, stats set like uh, a provider, I guess, on uh, Substack is telling me it said 197 downloads, which is pretty high for me. And then YouTube-wise, it did pretty well as well. It was like 119 views with, um, let's see, what was it? 22 hours of watch time, which is pretty sick. I usually get way less views and only like half an hour of watch time. (laughs) So... Anyways, thank you so much, everyone, for the support. It was fucking great. Uh, I'll plan on doing a couple more episodes like that where I interview a Bitcoiner who tells me their story. Looking forward to releasing those soon. But I did just want to do one regular podcast episode before then just to catch up with people and, you know, say sorry, I guess, for uh, releasing the episode late this week. Uh, As always, I try to have everything recorded by Sunday and, uh, you know, set it to publish for Monday morning on Sunday night, but it's just been a hectic week. So apologies. I'll do better for next week, but yeah. And also just wanted to catch up with people, just see how everyone's doing. Make sure all good. Just checking in on you as Bill Burr would say, stop listening to him now. I still love his stand up, but I can't listen to his podcast anymore. (laughs) So you guys been good? Uh, watching some sports ball, maybe? Did you just uh, see the uh, Kansas City Chiefs beat the Philadelphia Flowers at the Super Bowl last night? <laughs> I caught the halftime show and then the second half, barely paying attention. <laughs> Looked like it would have been exciting. The team that was losing came back to win it. Uh, but uh, I was not that interested in it. I was much more interested in the night before where there was uh, UFC fights happening. It was Islam Makhachev, the 155-pound champion, fighting uh, Alex Volkanovsky, fighting the 145-pound champ at 155. They were fighting for the 155 championship belt, and it was a crazy fight. Ended up ending with the guy who was the lighter guy, the 145 champ. I mean, they're at the same weight for the actual fight. At least they weighed in at the at the same weight. I'm sure when they refilled back up with water, uh, Makhachev was still quite a bit bigger, but the smaller guy ended up being on top at the end of the fight, like giving him a ground and pound. And it seemed like he'd done a lot of damage, and I thought for sure he was going to win it, but ended up being a decision one for the other guy. Somehow they thought that he had won three out of the five uh, rounds and so he won it that way even though the fight ended up with him being just like pretty dominated but such is the weird sport of uh, (laughs) fighting or mixed martial arts where for some reason you can lose in a situation like that but anyway the whole fight card was pretty crazy it was uh, all five five fights were really exciting the first fight that went to a decision as well while the rest were uh, knockouts or submissions. And even that first fight should have definitely like been stopped at some points, but continued on and finally they it ended. But it was pretty exciting. And I got to go watch the fights at uh, my training gym, which was pretty awesome, actually. It's a nice way to meet some people and hang out with the 
uh, jiu-jitsu community and it was pretty uh, exciting when uh, one of the fights ended with a triangle choke and everybody you know in the class is, uh, or at the gym is uh, obviously knows what that is because we practice that all the time so they're pretty excited for like a jiu-jitsu submission being used to end uh, a fight and it was for that that was the co-main event event which was also for a, a championship belt as well it like, anyways good times so yeah that's my level of sports ball involvement i watched the super bowl just barely and i was pretty excited for the for the fights that happened the day before what else happened it's been a while since i uh did one of these podcasts i guess the uh australian open championships happened as well i can't uh not mention those because of course what happened right uh novak djokovic won and of course this is a year after when he was uh, kicked out of the country for not being vaccinated and not allowed to compete and then next year it's all the bs is over and he comes back and wins it and he was very gracious in the acceptance speech after he won the tournament so just shows how great of a champion he is uh, the quality of his personality character i guess is a better word so anyway my last solo podcast i talked about the mexico trip since then it's been a bit of a downturn in our family because uh, we had a gastro bug flow through the whole family from, you know, me and my wife to, to the kids. And we had, yeah, out to both sides, things coming out that made it very difficult <laughs> to do anything, to feel good, to get anything done. But over like nearly two weeks later, we were finally cleared everything and we we're finally okay. <laughs> but it was a difficult two weeks and there was a lot of couch cushions that had to be cleaned up so <laughs> but we made it to the other side and we're good now but in that time during that week where i was not feeling great from that gastro bug i had seen on the news a couple of crazy articles related to health that i was like i need to talk about this and re respond to these crazy claims because they are crazy the first one was this article about how eggs are potentially causing blood clots uh, did i save the article it was like this yeah i think the article this the headline was scientists scientists warn eggs are causing thousands of people to suddenly form blood clots <laughs> It's like, this is the dumbest shit I've ever read. Like, I can't believe anyone would even write this. Because in that article, they blame choline for being the reason that there's an increase in blood clots, which is just so stupid because choline is an essential nutrient. Like, it has many important roles in the body that help it function optimally and make it be healthy like like there's brain development stuff like choline is uh, i think it turns into a neurotransmitter which is necessary for the brain to do its thing you know like for memories learning just doing stuff with your brain you know you need it right you need your brain you need neurotransmitters to make your brain work choline turns into neurotransmitters you need choline it doesn't cause blood clots freaking idiots like it helps with your liver like it has to do with some stuff like binding to like uh fat and moving it around i don't exactly know the deeds the details but this is not new stuff we know this okay you need liver pregnant people pregnant pregnant like women should definitely supplement with choline they're told that they're told to do that um yeah, you, you need freaking choline. It doesn't cause cause blood clots. <laughs> like, what is, I don't know. All this misinformation about food and how, like, animal protein, animal products are bad for you. This needs to end. Like, this is why people are unhealthy. One of the reasons, let's be honest, there's many. And that brings me actually to the second crazy thing that I heard that I had to like respond to which was this it was this video of a lady who is someone who's been picked to be a person that sets dietary guidelines in the united states 
and she's on 60 Minutes saying how the number one cause of obesity is actually genetics, nothing else but genetics. She goes on to talk about how when you see a family of fat people, you're probably judging them because it's like, look at how badly they're feeding their children. But in reality, this is genetics based and you shouldn't be judging them. <laughs> of course, taking all agency away from people who are obese because they can't actually make any decisions or choices or new, make new lifestyle uh, changes and habits that can empower them to take life under their control and <laughs> change things for the better for their health. It's already pre-written into your genes and there's nothing you can do about it except, except, oh wait, we've got these drugs and these surgeries you could do to help you with your obesity problem because there's nothing you could actually do yourself about it. <laughs> right. That's how it works. Right. Right. Like it's, it's, it, it, it's not that, uh, you might have a poor diet, right? It's not that you're eating like shit, eating unhealthy fats, eating a bunch of added sugar, a bunch of processed junk that's messing up your metabolism and making you gain fat. It's not, it's not that, right? It's, it's not your lack of physical activity. The fact that you have a sedentary lifestyle and just sit around all day and don't move. It's, it's not that. Look, genes always play a factor. They are very important because some people might be more prone to obesity due to certain factors related to genetics and epigenetics. You know, a lot of times there could be something stressful episode that happens during pregnancy in the mother that could have epigenetic, sorry, epigenetic impacts on the baby that let's say, for example, make it perhaps more sensitive to sugar or gluten or whatever it may be that can happen. Sure. But Ultimately, genetics and epigenetics, they load the gun, but you still got to pull the trigger. They set you up for something, but it doesn't have to be that way because the expression of genes is oftentimes what matters most, not what genes you actually have. And so if you can find a way of, you know, living which includes what your nutrition and your physical activity that is able to modulate the level of the expression of your genes in a way that you can have an optimal life, then you can be in control of what your body looks and feels like. You don't need to rely on drugs, pharmaceuticals, and surgeries. You don't need to cut your body to look and feel good. Every, like it is my belief, I could be wrong, I'm willing to hear out different opinions, but it is my belief that every genetic variation has the capability of producing a human that does not turn obese. <laughs> you just got to put it in the right environment and make it adopt the right set of habits for optimal health. And then there's also the, of course, the uh, social network. That's an important piece that, you know, is, is maybe missing in, in our culture. But anyway, I don't want to get off, off topic too much, but genetics is not the main thing that's driving obesity. You know, in a way, I've always argued that um, obesity is infectious and obviously not in a way like a respiratory, same way as a respiratory illness, but when one or two people in a family become obese, then the likelihood of the next few members of the family also getting obese is much greater. Partly, you know, due to just adapting to someone looking obese and thinking, oh, that's normal. So if that's normal for them, then I can do that too. That's a big part of it. And, you know, of course, now there's this whole movement against fat shaming. <laughs> but 
We don't need to shame anyone, right? We just need to be honest and show that we care about each other's health, ultimately, right? Health is what matters most. If you don't have health, you don't have anything else. And you're not healthy when you're obese. That's beyond argument. There's varying levels of, you know, body fat that people can have. And everyone has their own, you know, spot that they fit, that they look and perform their best. There's no one size fits all. But at the point where you're obese, that's beyond your optimal level without question. So yeah, those are the two things I saw in the news while I, the family was sick that I was like, can't respond to this now, but I made a note as like, I got to talk about this on the podcast because this is crazy. Eggs are not causing blood clots because the choline that they're blaming that's causing blood clots is an essential <laughs> nutrient. And genetics is not going to is not going to be the main driver of obesity, okay? Like obesity rates have like doubled or tripled in a generation and the genetics have stayed the same. They've not changed. Something else is the main driver. Anyway, let's move on. I want to read some Shakespearean insults because it's been a while. It's been a minute since I've done these. I've picked out three good ones and I'm going to go with. First one from Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. By Isis, I will give thee bloody teeth. <laughs> love it. I'll give you bloody teeth. And I also love Isis. I think Isis was the name of a goddess. Must have been an Egyptian goddess, given that it's Cleopatra. She was from Egypt, right? Great insult. By Isis, I will give thee bloody teeth. Perfect. Couldn't have said it better myself. Next, from King John. Out on thee, rude man, thou dost shame thy mother, and wound her honor with this diffidence. Didn't know what diffidence was, had to look that one up. It means modesty or shyness resulting from a lack of self-confidence. I don't know. I just like that it was rude man, and that, uh, uh, you know, it's always a good insult when the mother is involved. <laughs> thou dost shame thy mother. <laughs> And wound her honor. That's a good one to pull out every once in a while. All right, one more Shakespearean insult and then a Bitcoin update, I guess. All right, here's the last Shakespearean insult from Henry IV, part one. It goes, Thou art violently carried away from grace. There is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man. <laughs> there you go. Shakespeare didn't care. He fat shamed. <laughs> <laughs> in the likeness the devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man <laughs> and thou art violently carried away from grace you're not just not graceful anymore you've been violently carried away from it <laughs> brilliant shakespeare is brilliant at insults freaking love these and i'll keep reading them if you guys like them let me know email me by the way my email new email that you can email to is jmartfit at substack.com that'll work just send an email there and yeah let me know do you like these shakespearean insults okay so let's do our bitcoin update we're on block height 776,449 price of one bitcoin is trading for 21,701 us dollars one us dollar will buy you 4,608 satoshis don't forget that Satoshis are the smallest subunit that one Bitcoin, the asset, can be subdivided into. If you live in Canada and you're interested in purchasing some Bitcoin or smaller subunits, if you can't afford a whole one, which can be <laughs> called Satoshis or Sats, there is a referral link at the description of this video or podcast episode, whichever way you're consuming it, that is for a Canadian exchange called ShakePay which I recommend because of their low fees and ease of use. But there are other ways of getting your hands on Bitcoin. Hey, maybe even if you email me, I'll send you some. Think about that. jmartfit at substack.com. But so yeah, you noticed in that I said Bitcoin the asset. So Bitcoin the asset is the 
thing that you're buying that you that when you look at the your wallet let's say and it says you have an x number of bitcoin and you see that number that is the asset that's what you own but then there's also bitcoin the network which makes the asset possible so let's talk about that today and i'm going to be referring to this website which is learn me a bitcoin.com so it's a bit of a funny name but it's a good website with some good information from the home page there's like four tabs one's home beginners technical explorer i went on beginners and scroll down and there's a link you can click on that's the bitcoin network so that's what i'm going to be referring to and so the bitcoin network is simply the network of computers running the bitcoin program so all the computers on the network run the same computer program and what does the network do so people or the computers with that are running this computer program those computers in the network they're talking to each other or in another way of saying that they're passing information back and forth from one another and it's information about what's going on in other parts of the ne network and this is done by sending each other messages so for example a message could be information about a new transaction now the sharing of information in this example the transaction is what allows everyone in the in the network to, to keep up to date with what's going on which is of course very important if you want to run a digital currency on the internet so one person makes a digital transaction sends it to a peer that they're connected to multiple peers and each of those peers receives it and then you know they check it and then they pass it on to other peers and eventually everyone knows about this new transaction on the network and so the bitcoin network is a peer to peer network so it's a network because everyone is connected to each other and then it's peer to peer because everyone on the network is equal to one another and then so the question next question is who makes up the network and the answer to that question is that anybody with an internet connection can run the bitcoin program so you need a computer and an internet connection that's it those are your two only requirements which is why this is such an open network there's a very little you need to join it and once you have a computer up and running with the bitcoin program the software then that computer is a node on the network on the bitcoin network and that node on the network is equal to every other node on the net network they're of equal value no one can make the other node do anything that it doesn't want to do so another way of defining a node is just an individual running the bitcoin software and relaying information around the network so there you go we'll end it there that's all we'll talk about in terms of what the bitcoin network is and then maybe one additional thing i guess i'll add is like like we said you're relaying information and what information are you relaying transactions right the people are making transactions on the bitcoin network with bitcoin the asset the numbers that you see that tell you how much you have so just to summarize one more time Bitcoin the network is a peer to peer network made up of individuals running the Bitcoin software and they talk to each other and pass on information about new transactions and this allows everyone to stay up to date on the network and anyone with an active internet connection and a computer that runs the Bitcoin software can join the network and become a node and also do the relaying of information around the network and to join the easiest simplest way to do it is to download the bitcoin software from bitcoin.org that is a safe place to do it from now when you download the software from there and then you run it on your computer what it's going to do is it's going to connect your computer to other nodes on the network and then from those nodes you're going to start downloading a copy of the blockchain and the blockchain is just uh, the list of all the transactions that have ever happened on the bitcoin network 
So just be careful there because the blockchain is actually quite large in terms of its size. It's 500 megabytes or half a terabyte. So you need a lot of data storage in order to be able to run the Bitcoin software and download the full blockchain. Although I believe there are ways to not have the full blockchain downloaded, to just have pruned and partial bits of it. Um, but I guess there's some security risks associated with that. So anyways, look into it if you're interested in joining the Bitcoin network seeing it, how it works for yourself. If you've got a computer with a lot of data storage, give it a shot. It's super easy. Just go to bitcoin.org, download it. Yeah, go from there. All right, I'm going to end it there. Friends and fam, thank you so much for listening in on another episode of the Jmart cast. Thank you again for all the people who've subscribed to jmartfit at substack.com. Thank you all to all the people who checked out the previous uh, J Mart cast episode with John Tellis. Uh, like I said, 22 hours of watch time on that on YouTube and like over a hundred downloads um, of the podcast episode, just the audio version. So that's a lot for me, generally speaking. So thank you so much for all that. Really appreciate it. It means a lot. Love you all. Love the support. Love the kind words. And yeah, stay active. Be grateful. J Mart out.